beginning to read at verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out of to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Mm -hmm. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster, rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. May the Lord add the read, the bless, his blessing to the reading of his word. And a good morning again to each and every one of you. And we're glad that you're here this morning. All right. Good. So we're officially moved into our new place of residence. And uh, thank you for all those who prayed. Uh, helped out. We appreciated it very much and made the transition that much smoother because moving always doesn't matter how prepared you are. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> there are always the circumstances that you're ill prepared for and uh, sure enough uh, it happens. And that's how it is uh, oftentimes as we uh, serve the Lord. It doesn't matter uh, how well we think we are prepared. There are always circumstances that come into play that we're not really prepared for, even if we thought we were. No wonder Jesus said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but of course, the old flesh, that's my own commentary, is weak. Charles Spurgeon said, whenever God determines to do a great work, he first sets his people to pray. And so this morning, I do want to consider a passage of scripture that may help us and enlighten us as it relates to the ministry that the Lord has called us to. Even as we begin our prayer walk ministry, we are doing so believing that the Lord will do a great work in the hearts and lives of people drawing them to himself. Prayer, in one sense, is not an end in itself, sometimes it is, but it leads to an end. And therefore, when we think of what Jesus uh, exhorted the disciples to do in Matthew chapter 26, it's because there was a greater work that Jesus had prepared and was planned to walk through, walk down the path, uh, a difficult path, and he needed to, and his disciples needed to be prepared. And they were going to be, Jesus encouraged them to pray. Mm -hmm. So, as we think of the great work of evangelism and witnessing, it's wonderful to know that we have the scriptures and we can do a character study. That's a great way to learn about evangelism is to look at some of the heroes of faith. And this morning, we're going to consider one. We call him the Rock. His name is Petros, Peter. We're going to consider his credentials. He's, he's a fisher of men's delight. We're going to consider Peter as a fisher of men, but his denial. And finally, we're going to consider Peter the fisher of men and his destiny. So we see all of that in that little passage of scripture I read. But before we go any further, uh, let's just uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, again, we thank you that you've given us the ministry of prayer. You've given us the ministry of of evangelism and it's a work that only that can only be accomplished by you 
And we are simply your tools, instruments, ambassadors to be used by you. We pray for Pauline this morning as she plans to go to camp tomorrow. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would guide her, that she would have a blessed time, protect her, and may she be drawn closer to you and as she thinks of even your creation and the beauty of it. So we thank you for your goodness and your grace and our time together, and we do ask your blessing and leading in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So as we think of this passage of scripture that I read, of course we know what happened here. We oftentimes read it, Good Friday service, Easter season, because it's at the Passover. Nonetheless, we can gain great insight uh, from this passage any time of the year, and that's my plan here this morning. Um, as we think of Peter, though, we think that he was truly a fisher of men's delight. Why so? Because of his call, because of his conversion, because of Christ's compassion. We know that Peter was a called man. Jesus, back in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus calls Peter and his brother Andrew by the Sea of Galilee and said, follow me and I will send you out to be fishers of men. So we can clearly read that Peter was called to the ministry by the Son of God. It was not a, a, a thought of his own coming up with, oh, this is what I want to do. It was responding to the call of Jesus upon his life. I will make you a fisher of men. Jesus used the, the words in describing his, what Peter was doing in his work. And Jesus said, I've got a great work for you to do, to be a fisher of men. And he was also a converted man. One of the most well-known and beloved passages of Scripture is the, the passage where Peter says to Jesus, when Jesus says, who do you say I am? And of course, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We love that passage of Scripture, that it testifies to who Christ is. He is the Messiah, the Christ. So he was a converted man. And of course, he was a blessed man. Right after that, Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. It's a blessing to know the Lord and to be called by Him. And Peter was such an individual. Indeed, he was a fisher of men's delight. If you want to be a fisher of men, you first need to be called. You need to be converted. It needs to be a work of God. And it's a blessing to know the Lord and to be called by Him, such as Peter was. He learned from the Master. He learned from the Master. What did he learn from the Master? I'm sure he learned about the compassion of Christ in Matthew 14. When Peter jumps onto, onto the water because Peter had said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. And Jesus encourages to come. And Peter jumps out of the boat, walking on the water, and beginning to sink. What, he, what does he do? He cries out to the Lord, Lord, save me. And Jesus stretches out his arm and pulls him out of the water. And he was sinking down into he knew of the compassion of the Lord. Indeed, he was called, he was converted, and he knew of Christ's compassion was Peter. Talk about a fisher of men's delight. Those are all prerequisites to being a fisher of men. We also learn of a fisherman's denial. If we think of Peter, and we think of the privileged position the powerful position that he was in. We ask ourselves, why do all four Gospels recount this event in Peter's life? Peter's threefold denial of Christ found in all four Gospels. But why would the chief of the disciples deny even knowing him after all that Jesus has been through? What I counted to this point, is all past in Peter's experience with the Lord. These are all things that he's already gone through. And then we get to Matthew chapter 26. 
Can you imagine three times people say, who's Jesus? You know Jesus. Tell me about him. And three times, no thanks. I don't want to tell you about him. That's what Peter did in this passage of scripture. There are several lessons we can extract from this passage as well by weaving together the gospel's accounts of uh, this uh, denial. We read in Peter's first denial here, look at verse 69. Jesus had already been brought inside uh, the courtyard and he was answering to the high priest's questions. He was being interrogated and Peter wanting to see the outcome set down among the others who were warming themselves by a fire. And a servant girl challenged Peter, you were also with him. Now of course we know these are, this is a difficult time. This was they, the disciples were not prepared for what Jesus is now experiencing and going through, though they were warned already. And this servant girl says, you were with him. Now Peter was not a weak man. A weak man. He's a fisherman by trade. If you were to look at Peter, his physical presence would undoubtedly exude strength. You can just imagine a fisherman pulling the nets out of the water, casting the nets. His hands must have been strong. Physically, he was strong. However, something happened here. Peter melted away under the pressure. He says in his response to this girl, I don't know what you're talking about. It's a rather kind of conspicuous type of denial. It's, he's hedging. He's not going all out. We're going to see an erosion take place in these three denials, that they get progressively worse and stronger and more vehement. He is in opposition to those who were declaring that he knew Jesus. <laughs> and in denial too, another servant girl, it says, in, ver in verse 71, comes to him and says, then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, this time though, the denial is even more passionate because he says, he, he denies Jesus with an oath. I promise I never saw that man. I've never been with that man. And the third denial. Luke tells us it was about an hour later. Jesus is taken already away. Here we see Peter and with another disciple, probably John. They're inside the court. They're in a place where they can maybe hear, if not see, what's going on. They want to be close by on that night that Jesus was betrayed. This time, though, He's even more vehement, more passionate in his denial. A little while later, those standing there went up to Peter in verse 73 and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Remember, Peter is a Galilean. Now, Galileans were looked down upon, were frowned upon, that even their accent gave them away by the Judeans around in Jerusalem and Galilee was to the north where Nazareth was. So by uh, just his accent and of course undoubtedly what others have already heard of accusing Peter of even simply stating that Peter had been with Jesus, they came to the conclusion he's definitely been with them. But Peter, it says, what does it say? With curse words. Jesus, Peter denied that he had been with Jesus in verse 74. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. The term he called down with curses and he swore to them, it does not 
it's not saying that he was cussing or swearing in our contemporary sense of how we would understand it, but that he was literally saying, if I'm not telling the truth, God curse me. And that would, or some have suggested that he was cursing Jesus in denying Jesus. And that's how vehemently he was opposed to even identifying with Jesus. Why did Peter deny Jesus is the question. Why did he do that? Janet suggested, Jan more or less took my sermon away because she said she thought it was because of fear. Is that right, Jan? Well, that's true. Let's close our Bible and let's go right to the Lord's table. And that is one of the reasons, but perhaps there are others that we can glean from this text. That why, uh, why Peter would so vehemently, vehemently deny who the one that Peter followed so closely. Well, let's look at the fisherman's destiny, the lessons. Part of the fisherman's destiny here is that we can learn from who Peter was. Maybe that is why all four Gospels ha have recorded this event in the life of Peter. Number one lesson that you and I can learn, if we want to be fishers of men, you can say, I've been, I've been converted to Christ, I know that. I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And you can even mention a date in which that wonderful transformation occurred. And you can say, I know that Jesus has called me to preach the gospel. And I have opportunities every day, whether it be in the place of work, whether it be in my community, perhaps even within my own family, um, an extended family. What do I need to remember and of course, I, I know that Christ is a compassionate God because I've been the recipient of his compassion time and time and time again. All of that is true. But you can also identify with someone coming to you and saying, didn't you? Or don't you know Jesus? And for some reason, you're caught off guard. You're not ready to give an account of who Jesus is, testifying to his grace and mercy for whatever reason. Maybe we can learn some lessons. Number one, do not lag behind. Peter followed Jesus. Look what it says, that he followed Jesus at a distance in verse 58. Earlier, we read in this chapter, the Last Supper. Jesus the disciples were sitting right by Jesus, right there. Jesus could have said anything, and he did. And they were going to say, no, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. Whatever you say. If you say jump, I'll say how high. Mm -hmm. That was their attitude as they partook of the Lord's table, the Last Supper. But then things happened. Jesus was taken away from them. The plan of Satan is to divide and conquer. If Satan can get you to take your eyes off of Jesus, to separate you from your Savior, he's winning. He's winning, and he's accomplishing what he set out to do, to divide and conquer. If Satan can keep us from walking closer with the Lord, there's a greater possibility that you and I will be in no place to say this is who Jesus is for me. This is what he means to me. This is what he's done for me. And that's exactly what happened. They had to follow Jesus behind at a distance. They were no longer looking to Jesus to learn from him. They were just looking just to know what was going on. They no longer knew him in the same way that they once did earlier because there was no fellowship there. How can you be a fisher of men when you're out of fellowship, when you're lagging behind and you're at a distance? To be in close communion with Christ is essential if one is to converse with the lost in a significant and meaningful way. 
And Peter had lost that along with all of the other disciples. A second lesson that we can learn from this event in Peter's life is not to be overconfident. Our faith in God is unwavering until what? Testing. Whenever self is at the center of God's work, it is bound to fail. What an opportunity Peter had to proclaim the gospel to that group of people that were sitting by. They weren't necessarily accusing Jesus of wrong. They were associated with uh, the, the religious type, no question about it. And what a wonderful opportunity for Peter to stand up and say, yes, he's God. He is the Savior. He is the one that Israel has been waiting for, the Messiah. Three times he had opportunity to simply say that. People were asking him, as if saying, who is he? But because Peter was overconfident about who he was, about his own accomplishments, he was not prepared for who uh, Jesus is when the time of testing came and to declare the glory of the Lord and to proclaim the gospel. We need to be, we need to be reminded of that, how sinful we are without Christ, how selfish we are without Christ, how overconfident we can be without walking humbly with our God. And I think that would be an apt description of Peter at this juncture in his life. There was too much of Peter and not enough of Jesus. The whole idea of a prayer walk is not to rely on a formula, and I submit, suggested this on Thursday. It's not a formula that we're thinking, this is, this is the way to do it. It's a, it's a walk of faith that God is going to do a work. Remember, Peter had earlier boasted he would never deny the Lord. Just in this chapter, Peter had denied. Peter had said, even if all fall away on account of you, in verse 33, I never will. Have you ever been there? You know, on a Sunday, we're all filled with the Spirit. We're all ready to go. And then Monday morning comes along, and someone says something, and you're ill-prepared. Ill-prepared for the opportunity. What a, what a contrast between Peter and Jesus in this, as this event unfolds as well. Jesus is on trial, and so is Peter, figuratively. And we see the two and their responses. Jesus is in trial. Jesus is on trial inside the palace of Caiaphas and tells the truth in his response. Peter is on trial outside of the palace and lies in his response to the questions asked of him. And his, Peter's situation was much less threatening than Jesus' was. Peter's denial forms a proof of the weakness of anyone who thinks he or she can follow Jesus by relying on their own strength. Do not be overconfident. Every day, walk with humility. Wake up in the morning recognizing, I can do nothing of myself. May your spirit do the work in me and through me because my flesh is prone to wander, prone to disobey, and prone to sin. We also see that be ready in all circumstances, not only when it is convenient or rehearsed. He was ill prepared to be drawn into a confession of faith by declaring his allegiance to Christ, if it cost him his life, that's where fear comes in. Peter was thinking of his own life. If they're going to treat Jesus like they are, what's going to happen to me? He did not want to be even guilty of association. 
There is no way Peter could have predicted these circumstances a few hours earlier. Even though he had, even though he and the other disciples were warned that Jesus was going to be handed into the hands of men uh, and they were going to mistreat him and he was going to be crucified and on the third day he was going to rise from the grave. They knew that. They knew the gospel story. But they were ill prepared to experience it when the time came and to go through with it. So how do you prepare yourself for circumstances? You can't prepare yourself for everything. You can't sit up all day thinking, well, if this happens and that person says that, this is how I'm going to respond. If someone else comes here and that happens, this is how I'll react. We sit at home all day thinking about circumstances because there's so many unprepared things and circumstances that can occur. There's only one way to prepare yourself for giving a testimony to who Christ is. And 1 Peter gives us the answer. It's simply set apart Christ as Lord. In your hearts, be prepared. In your hearts, Revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. At this juncture in Peter's life, he was ill prepared. He had not set Christ apart as Lord, even though he had said earlier, Jesus is Lord. At that moment, Christ was not the Lord of his life. Because things weren't working out the way he thought they were. And so often is the case. When it seems like it's the most difficult of circumstances that we're going through, all of a sudden, we see wonderful opportunities in these circumstances. And yet, oftentimes, we look back and say, I was ill-prepared to respond. Because the circumstances robbed us of our responsibility to set Christ apart as Lord in our hearts. That's where it begins. It's a heart work before it's a word work. As well, another lesson, and this was and is a spiritual work and not a physical work. You see, the power for witnessing and sharing your faith, it's not a work of the flesh, but of the Spirit. You see, the promised Holy Spirit had not come down yet. If you're a dispensationalist, as I am, the Holy Spirit only came down in Acts chapter 2 to seal believers. So that believers today have a privileged place as compared to saints of the Old Testament. Because every believer today possesses the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that testifies of who Jesus is. And we just have to read John chapter 16. That Jesus said, unless I go away, I cannot send the Advocate or the Comforter, referring to the Holy Spirit. And when He comes, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And so Peter was ill-prepared. He didn't even possess the Spirit of God. Though he was, at that point, an Old Testament believer. But he almost crossed, he crossed over into the New Testament in Acts chapter 2. And everyone started speaking in different languages. And the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit began in the lives of believers. It's a spiritual work. That's why we're exhorted to be controlled by the Spirit. And fifthly, and very importantly for you and I, why, you know, we're almost, Peter, if Peter could know about the finished work, Word of God, the completion of the scriptures, and say, no, 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 why me? You know, why for all gospels? Leave me out of this, please. Do you have to tell me? Do you have to tell the whole world what I did? <laughs> well, Peter, be encouraged because there's hope for us because we read about you. You see, Peter's denial shows us that Christ will not let go of those that belong to him. Amen? Amen? What happened after the third denial, the clock hit midnight, and the rooster crowed. And the look of Jesus, it doesn't say it in here, but I believe it's in uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke, and the recounting of this event, that it says Jesus looked at Peter. 
And Jesus, and the look of Jesus was enough to convict Peter. And in time he would be restored and brought back into fellowship with his Lord and Savior. So the question is, why do all four Gospels record this event? And surely it wasn't for the purpose of putting the hate on Peter. An all out attack on Mr. Big Shot. Perhaps to remind us that if Peter can deny the Lord, so can you and I. Maybe to also to encourage us that past failures are not an end or pre and there is a present and a future ministry because Christ will not let us go if we belong to him. We can be encouraged about this passage of scripture. Let us not leave discouraged, but encouraged that Peter fell, you and I have fell, but we have an eternal, loving, faithful Father in heaven and Savior who will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. No wonder Peter ran to the tomb on that first day of the week we call Easter Sunday. Because if it's true that Jesus rose from the grave, perhaps he could hear the words of Jesus again. The last, the last time Peter saw Jesus outside of the crucifixion was when Jesus looked at him and Peter was filled with conviction following the resurrection. And you can read about that in John chapter 21. Peter's restored. No wonder Peter ran to that empty tomb. Oh, how those words must have been, those post-resurrection words must have been so precious to Peter. Feed me. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter says, you know I do love you. Even though I fell, you know I love you. And so we can be encouraged with this event that occurred in Peter's life, and we can identify with it. But we can learn lessons also of what not to do. So that as we think of this prayer walk and the opportunity that it may lead to sharing our faith, sharing the glorious gospel, what, is, what, what an opportunity that will be. Let me conclude with this story. Who saved me? During a terrible storm at sea that threatened every moment to carry the ship to the bottom, one of the ship's crew was doing something on the deck when a great sea struck the ship and went fairly over the deck, striking this man with great force, disabling him and carrying him into the mad waters. Although he was a good swimmer, he was so disabled that he could only keep above the water. They saw him lifting up his hands, imploring people through the white foam, crying out to save me. But the captain said, don't lower a boat. For no small boat can live in this sea. In this terrific storm, we cannot save the man. The most we can do is save the ship. The vessel was buried farther and farther from the helpless man. One more, once more they saw this, the imploring hands of the sinking man crying for help. Still the captain said, a small boat must not be lowered, as it could not live a moment among these wild billows. But one man, who was an expert swimmer, was so moved by the imploring signals of the drowning man that he threw off his loose garment saying, I will save this man or die with him trying to save him. So plunging into the surging deep, he struggled so bravely with the mad waters that he reached the poor man just as his strength had gone. He had given up and was filling with water and sinking down unconscious. He grasped him and, strange to tell it, he brought him so near the ship that they did let down a boat to rescue the two of them. As soon as the rescued man opened his eyes because they both lay on the boat in a semi-conscious state. And he realized he was not in the ocean. His first words were, who saved me? He was pointed to his deliverer, still lying on the deck in his wet clothes. He crept to his deliverer and putting his arms around his feet and in the most tender and heart-moving tone of voice cried out, I'm your servant, I'm your servant. He felt that he could never do enough 
for him, the one who saved him. So let me ask you, would you not put your arms about the bleeding feet of your great deliverer and say from a full heart, Jesus, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. Ask anything of me, Jesus, and I will do it the best I can. According to your way, according to your strength. And so this morning, as we think of this passage of Scripture, and the wonderful work that God has called us to, it's because of who Jesus is that we do it. So as we think of these elements before us, the fruit of the vine, the bread, speaking of the body and blood of Christ, and the finished work of the cross, as we partake of the Lord's table, may we be reminded that we don't want to deny our Savior, but if we have, Jesus is a forgiving God. He will restore us to a place where we can begin be in fellowship with Him and move forward, sharing the love of Christ, telling the old, old story. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with in Christ Jesus. And as we've considered a passage of Scripture so familiar, and Lord, at times still so convicting. This passage reminds us of our own shortcomings. But Lord, we thank you that you're not done with us, even though we fail you time and time again. We want to be used by you to declare your glory to the nations. And by your grace and your power. In Jesus' name I pray.